Shabbat Shalom. Here in Parshat Naso, we read about the completion and dedication of the Mishkan for the third time. Back in Shemot and Exodus, the culmination of the Mishkan took place with God's presence covering the Ohel Moed in a cloud. And then later in Vayikra, the book of Leviticus, the very same event is described with God's presence descending in fire on the altar. And now here in the book of Naso, the completion is described by the presence of the Nisi'im, the heads of tribes and their presentation of gifts. Now, while the manifestation of God in the accounts of Shemot and Vayikra might be considered vertical, the cloud and the fire are transcendent expressions of the divine that penetrate into the earthly world. Here in the book of Numbers in Bamidbar, the expression is horizontal through people presenting gifts to God. And it's not just any people, it's the heads of the tribes, the representation of all the facets of Israel as they step forward from their assigned place, their machane, the camp, where the arrangement is perfectly balanced and intentional. Here, the holiness of the Mishkan is expressed through human relationships, through how individuals relate to each other and God, honoring the boundaries of others and themselves in the camp. In fact, later in the book, when we read the portion of Balaam, the sorcerer sent to curse Israel, Rashi, our famous commentator, explains what prompted him to bless, deliver the blessing Matovu instead of the curse. As Bilam the sorcerer looked over the mountain at the camp of the Israelites, he noticed that all the tents were arranged so that no person could look into each other's tent. The people of Israel lived and camped so close together, intimately connected, but deeply respectful of each other's boundaries. It was the integrity of their relationships that moved him to bless. Integrity and relationship is the knowledge and respect of what is one's own and what is another's. And this can range from owning one's own experience, perception, and emotions instead of projecting it onto others, to honoring the boundaries and purpose of our unique relationships with each person in our lives. <clears throat> it's the integrity of the divine vision of Israel's camp that is the context for the law and the story of the sota. Sota means to go astray. And if a man suspects that his wife has committed adultery, then she can agree to be taken to the Kohen priest to go through the test of the bitter waters. The Kohen takes sanctified water in an earthen vessel, mixes in earth from the floor of the Mishkan, and inscribes the oath promising death if she's guilty on the scroll and then dissolves it into the bitter waters. If the woman is guilty of adultery, she dies. If she's innocent, then she gives birth to a child. Now, there are a couple of aspects to this ritual that are worth taking note of. First, the woman who is suspected of adultery gets to choose whether she goes through the ritual. If she says no, then the husband can choose to divorce or do nothing. So the woman would only go through the ritual to prove her innocence. The second perplexing aspect of the ritual is that the outcome of being innocent is an actual reward, having a child, something that would not have necessarily happened if she wasn't accused in the first place. So what's going on? Our rabbis point out that the sota did go astray even if she didn't commit adultery. The husband who accuses her is responding to real concerns. He sees her spending time privately with another man. He senses an energy between her and another man. He is not just an insanely jealous spouse. There is an emotional boundary that she crosses within the relationship. And this crossing is very human and very normal, and at the same time threatens to damage 
the integrity of the relationship if it's not dealt with skillfully. The rabbis connect the word sota, to go astray, with shota, which means to go insane, or literally, to float. For many different reasons, each one of us, in different ways, may have moments of floating where we lose our rootedness in the reality of our relationships and instead escape into fantasy. And it's this lunacy that allows a man or woman to risk family, lifelong career, and reputation for a fling. It is this destructive behavior that actually defines the lunatic. In the case of the sota, who proves herself innocent, she did go astray. She became entranced in moments of fantasy where subconsciously or consciously she actually believed that a relationship with a, or encounter with another man outside her husband would answer her problems, would make her whole. And yet, in spite of these moments of fantasy, and in spite of her finding excuses to spend time with a certain man, she did not act on it. She respected the boundaries of her marriage. If her marriage was only a partnership where each person agrees to be together as long as they get certain things from each other, then it's easy to justify breaking boundaries because in the adulterer's mind, they're not being fulfilled by the other. But if marriage is a relationship where each partner is conscious that their covenant with each other is about growing and deepening their sense of self and connection with each other and God, then to act on fantasy betrays the integrity of the relationship. And this is why the sota, who is found innocent, is rewarded with a child. She was lost in fantasy, tempted, but ultimately honored the integrity of her marriage. And her choice to participate in the ritual, even though she opens herself to public embarrassment, shows her willingness to acknowledge the danger of the fantasy before it goes too far, to affirm the reality of her marriage covenant and its preciousness. The Sota ritual brings to awareness our awareness to the fact that we may temporarily lose our sanity for moments, shota, that we may find ourselves adrift, floating. And that isn't a lack of integrity. That's just human. When we affirm the sacred boundaries of our relationships in spite of our fantasies, then we are part of the Mishkan, part of the camp of Israel, where each tribe has its own flag and its role and every one of our connections has its unique and special place. So here are some questions for reflection or discussion. The rabbis thought that the sota acted in the direction of her fantasy, but ultimately did not cross the boundary. Do you think this is wrong? Why or why not? And we have fantasies of all kinds. Are there any ways that fantasy can enhance our relationships or lead to other positive outcomes? And finally, do any of the boundaries that are present in your relationships, whatever they are, feel stifling? And what do you think that's about? Wish everybody a beautiful and peaceful Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom.